like to uh, welcome you to the fourth Berkeley Writers of Work session. It's wonderful to see a good turnout. We're delighted that you're here. My name is Nick Jewell. I'm the Vice Provost. And it's a special privilege for me to uh, be a part of this uh, lunchtime gathering. I'm particularly excited about the title of this workshop, Writers at Work, because I think of myself as a writer at work. A little bit early on uh, in my stages of writing, I was a mathematics major, uh, in part because I didn't want to write any papers through my entire uh, college career, and pretty much succeeded uh, at that goal. But you know, later on in life, I've tried to write, and I suspect many of you are here for the same purposes, that you're really closet writers at work. And uh, we welcome you, and, and this is in part the function of these sessions, is to encourage you to come out of the closet and meet with some great Berkeley writers and share with them and hear them share with us their perspective on the writing process. Um, I happen to be reading a book that I picked up at the uh, Computer Museum at uh, MIT recently and noticed there was a Berkeley faculty member in there, I don't think she's here, Pam, Pamela Samuelson, she's not here, either, who's a professor in the law school in the School of Information and Management Sciences and the thing I remember about, I don't remember anything about the intellectual property law that was discussed in there, but I do remember that she said she had a half-finished mystery book. And I said, me too. And uh, so, I'm, as I say, we're all writers at work and in our work, but also in our personal lives. My own daughter, when I ask her now what she wants to do when she grows up, she's 11, says she wants to be a writer, much to my astonishment, because it certainly didn't come from me. But uh, I have a real personal interest in today's uh, session. Um, before I uh, introduce uh, Dean Porter, I wanted to acknowledge that this program is underwritten generously by the College Writing Programs and by Dean Porter, who's the Dean of Undergraduate uh, Studies at Berkeley. Um, and I think without further ado, I'll ask Dean Porter to introduce this lunchtime speaker. Welcome. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege and also a pleasure. We've got new microphones. Very good. To welcome you to uh, to this event. Um, these events have now been going on for what a couple of years now, and they've all been extremely um, provocative um, and successful. More particularly, I take great pleasure in introducing uh, Professor Frederick Cruz, who is both a friend and colleague of mine of many years. Um, he is among the university's most distinguished scholars, teachers, and writers. He won the Distinguished Teaching Award, as well as uh, being a UC Regents Research Lecturer. He has also served as Chair of the English Department. <coughs> a task that he once characterized as the most formidable challenge of his career, since it required, and I quote, learning how to herd cats. <laughs> <laughs> Whether he was herding cats as a chair or producing landmark studies of Hawthorne, Forster, and James, Fred has always been a model of sanity as well as brilliance, a generous colleague, and a demanding teacher, demanding both himself and his students. Meanwhile, he has contributed in an immeasurable way to the Academy's ongoing effort to sustain and enrich our culture's capacity for good writing and clear thinking. Probably most well known, certainly most notably, the Random House Handbook, now in its sixth edition, I'm told, uh, has achieved virtually biblical authority for students and faculty alike. Indeed, you don't want to go into your office and write anything without it. Um, Meanwhile, however, I want to alert you, in case you didn't already know this, to the fact that there is another Fred. This Fred is one that you come to know primarily through his essays and letters and his responses to critics. This Fred is very funny. He's hilariously witty. For example, in the list of quotations you have, my favorite is from the Pooh Perplex, where he says, what is the purpose the inner necessity of Winnie the Pooh. 
I pray to see if any chapter might cause us to wonder whether the book has an appeal, any appeal whatsoever. A toy bear and a toy pig follow their own tracks around the tree until they are told and by a small boy that this is pointless and all retire for lunch. <laughs> it is clear, I think, that Pooh must address us on an essentially subliminal level. <laughs> <clears throat> This Fred is not only extremely witty and funny, he is also <coughs> quite devastating. In a series of books and essays, and perhaps beginning with the Pooh Perplex going on through titles such as Skeptical Engagements, Out of My System, The Critics' Barren Way, most recently The Memory Wars, <coughs> this Fred has left a virtual burned earth in his wake. <laughs> <clears throat> systematically, but always with a cutting and dry wit, destroying pretensions wherever they crop up in his path. Psychoanalysis has, of course, suffered the most from this Sherman-like march, but any form of critical excess, pretension, or tomfoolery is always and everywhere vulnerable uh, and waiting Fred's uh, sword. <clears throat> Apparently, something happens to Fred when he sits down to write. Uh, something his friends, colleagues, and readers have long learned, uh, long since learned, to fear as well as respect. Readers of the New York Review of Books, for example, know this Fred perhaps the best, as is illustrated by his most recent critiques here of people devoting their careers to the UFO watch. <coughs> I also uh, want to take to uh, introduce Steve Tolleson, who is also himself a winner of the Distinguished Teaching Award on this campus, um, as well as the author of several books, um, my favorite being Grammar Grams 1 and 2. Um, he's a, an extremely important and irreplaceable presence on this campus in relation to all the writing programs and efforts that are being made across the campus, uh, sometimes in unlikely places. Uh, to foster the uh, study and, and achievement in writing and composition and communication generally. So, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to interview Fred and find out what happens to him when he writes. Thanks so much, Carol. And I know she doesn't agree with me about everything, too, but that's especially, oh, yes, <laughs> especially generous. I've been told to start by reading for a few minutes for my own prose, so that's what I'll do without making any comment, except to say this is the very latest thing that I published, if you don't count some letters that came out afterwards. Um, this is from, um, what's the date? June 25th of uh, this year, it's an essay review, review essay, on the question of UFO abductions, various books on the subject. And I'll, I'll probably read for about five minutes from the opening of this. <clears throat> is this too echoey? Should I back away? Well, uh, what's happening is that the, the stand there is bouncing against the, I believe, uh, if you move the stand away. Or I'm bouncing against it. Oh, that. Okay. Thanks. According to a Times CNN poll published a year ago, 64% of Americans now believe that creatures from elsewhere in the universe have recently been in personal touch with human beings. One such mortal, Whitley Strieber, writes that he has, quote, received nearly a quarter of a million letters claiming contact, unquote, in the past 11 years alone. Indeed, many people, most of them mere students of the topic rather than experiencers, think that the aliens, having subjected abductees to breeding experiments in parked spaceships or secret underground laboratories, have already produced a race of hybrids who will someday rule um, or even replace us. The hybrids may in fact be shopping and commuting all around us as I write. <coughs> and even if they aren't, their mixed parentage 
could help to explain the familiar images found in abduction memories like the following, culled from each of the three books under review here. Number one, he's got on a, a multi-striped t-shirt and some like blue shorts. They had sophisticated looking toys, like maybe they got them out of Edmund Scientific or something. They have a yo-yo. It looks like an Etch-a-Sketch screen, except it's filled with all sorts of stuff. Number two. They were dressed like 1920s thugs and came into the bedroom with old-fashioned Tommy guns aiming at me and blazing away. Number three. Beth Collings saw a naked man in an enormous white cowboy hat. <laughs> Carla Turner mentions two people she knows who have seen aliens disguised as hillbillies. <laughs> Katharina Wilson had an experience with an alien masquerading as Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> Once recollections of this kind are taken to be authentic, guesswork about the alien's true nature and purpose becomes irresistible. What if, for example, Katharina Wilson's visitor wasn't just masquerading as Al Gore, <laughs> but was Al Gore? The hybrid or body snatcher who has already replaced the man from Tennessee. And if so, the alien takeover of our executive branch surely wouldn't have stopped at the second in command. Consider this provocative observation by the renowned abduction expert David M. Jacobs, and I quote, because the late state hybrids are mainly human, they have strong sexual drives, <laughs> but little conscience. <laughs> It is as if they have human attributes but lack human controls. <laughs> Even if they do have a conscience, they know that the human victim will immediately forget what happened to her. <laughs> the hybrid might assume that there is no lasting effect upon the human, and he therefore can do and say anything he pleases with impunity." Unquote. Could the space creature that has assumed the form of Bill Clinton <laughs> be hideously mocking us when it keeps invoking executive privilege? <laughs> of course, there are difficulties to be ironed out before speculations along these lines can become fully respectable. One of them has to do with distance. In the planet circling our sun, no creatures besides ourselves are known for their partiality to tourism. <laughs> what then about the next nearest star, Alpha Centauri? Voyaging from that vicinity at the generous estimate of a million miles per hour, our current visitors would have had to wave goodbye to their loved ones around the time of Moses. <laughs> And then having briefly played doctor with their favorite specimens, some white Americans, they could look forward to devoting another three millennia to the return trip. <laughs> Would it, to quote Prufrock, have been worth it after all? <laughs> to the unlikelihood of such persistent travel must be added the fact that modern UFO incidents, from the still hotly debated Roswell, New Mexico Air Force case of 1947 until now, can be accounted for in rationally acceptable, mundane terms. Misleading optical effects, half-waking dreams, sleep paralysis, tricks of memory, paranoid delusions, temporal lobe lesions, intoxication, fraud, and fadism are abundantly familiar to us. Whereas the UFO thesis, even without the added burden of abduction tales, flouts the known laws of nature at every turn. Lacking even a scrap of credible physical evidence, ufologists have had to fall back on an appeal to numbers. How, they ask, could so many trustworthy witnesses be wrong about having spotted a spacecraft? Well, just replace spacecraft with witch, ghost, angel, Loch Ness monster, abominable snowman, or face of Mother Teresa on a bun, <laughs> and you have your answer. Yes.
<laughs> whenever possible for uh, the things that he said. Uh, uh, before we begin, I do have some notes. Uh, ASUC has set up a, a table with uh, several of Fred's books for sale, and I encourage you actually to buy all his books that are in print. I found them all wonderful. Uh, also, out in the foyer, there is a sign-up sheet. Uh, if you'd like to be on the mailing list, we, we send a postcard uh, whenever we're scheduling one of these events to, to let you know. With those as preparation, uh, I'd like to quote from Fred to begin. Uh, this is from uh, his latest book, Unauthorized Freud, and this is the introduction to an essay by Stanley Fish, who in fact used to be a, a faculty member here and who tried to run me over with his Porsche once, but I'm sure that's irrelevant. <laughs> uh, Stanley Fish is talking about the language of Freud. And he says, only by becoming conscious students of Freud's rhetoric, Fish implies, can we free ourselves altogether from its spell. For the last month, whenever I've said Freud to someone, it's come out Fred. And whenever I've said Fred, it's come out Freud. And so I thought if we change this, only becoming conscious students of Fred's rhetoric, can we free ourselves altogether from its spell. And so I'd like that to sort of be the note that we use uh, for, for today. And in all of these, we start sort of simply, Fred, and we find out sort of some basic things about, about you as a writer. This is sort of, I know one of your favorite things is free association, uh, Freudian free association, and you believe in, in it very strongly. So uh, I'll throw out some terms, and you can just, you can tell me what you think of them. But I'd like to start by saying that when I think of you writing, I don't think of you as a guy sitting there in his underwear eating a pastrami sandwich at the typewriter. So describe to us where you write, when you write. OK. Are we amplified here or not? Are, are, are we OK? To... You're okay. Are we OK? In the, in the back? Right. OK. A okay. little louder. Little louder. Uh, there isn't any one place that I write. It's actually an interesting question. Um, I take notes on books wherever I happen to be reading them. And by the way, uh, although I mark up these books, these are books that I own, so don't mark up <laughs> library books. Uh, and then I go to big yellow pads and take notes on my own marginalia to these books and gradually start to organize some general categories of ideas without worrying too much what I'm going to be saying. My aim at that point is to try to take into account everything that might eventually influence whatever it is that I do say. Now, I don't want to get a premature thesis. Um, and when I'm satisfied with my yellow notes, which again, I will just take wherever I happen to be, then I go to the computer and start organizing a, a little more carefully. And when I think I have something approaching an outline, I start writing. But the writing process goes back and forth between the computer and the yellow pads. Uh, and I can't tell you exactly why, but it, it works for me personally. I will, I will write out a few pages at the most and then, and then print them out and then take them elsewhere, take them to another room it's nice to have more than one room, I know. Uh, and treat them as the reader rather than the writer. Look at these things as prose written by somebody else and say, what's the matter with this? And where does it go from here? What else could this person do? And start writing on the yellow pads again. And when I'm satisfied that I've made a little progress, I go back to the computer. So there's a dialogue with myself that is spatial as well as intellectual. The two pl the places where I work are sort of, um, in a funny way, in communication with each other. Let me ask about the, the yellow pads. You said that you just you have one with you. I mean, is that literally true, that you usually have a yellow pad and that you'll pull it out and, and make notes? Like, you know, if Dean Porter were talking and something dawned on you, might no. you jot a note down? No, no. Not, not to her, but to someone. You, 
if I were remind, talking. You remind me of an old Stanley Fish story. He used to tape his own lectures because he thought that the world could not do without them. <laughs> uh, the, he didn't want to waste. He didn't want to waste any of these precious insights. So he he taped his own stuff and then studied it. <laughs> no. I'm a little more humble than that. So when. Give us some examples of, of when you would about, do it. I'm talking about knowing that I want to write about something <laughs> and focusing on that thing. And I, I, I don't regard myself as a particularly original writer. You know, if you gave me an assignment to write something interesting by tomorrow, I would panic, absolutely panic. I would have nothing to say. I can only write in relation to issues that have been presented to me or especially books that have been presented to me. And my favorite way of working is to have three or four books on the same topic and start thinking about how they differ from each other and why. And then, then my own mind starts working, but not before. So when you, when you get to the typewriter, the typewriter, the typewriter. I'm not that old, uh, the computer, do you, do you work at home? Do you work at, at school? Uh, do you have an office dedicated to this? Is it uh, a mess? Is it neatly organized? Tell us. Well, I've always worked at home, but since I retired, I have to say, I have a little place up in the mountains, and I do not subscribe to the TV service up there, and I do not get any newspapers, no mail. So, but I do have my oldest little Macintosh SE up there, and it's an ideal place to work. Uh, I'm sure everybody, everybody who's tried to write knows that um, the temptation to flee from the task of writing to any other form of distraction uh, is overwhelming. And I will not subscribe to cable TV, even here in Berkeley, because I know that I would be watching the Tiddlywinks channel <laughs> instead of doing my work. And the only way I can be completely self-disciplined is to be completely away from all of these wonderful distractions. And so do you, do you have a schedule when you're working on, on something? Like when you're working on, on Authorized Freud, do you say, OK, I'm going to write from 8 AM to noon, or I'm going to write 10 pages today? Or No, I don't, unless I have to. You know, if you, write a, if you write a book review for the New York Times, they want it on a certain day. And you jolly well better get it into them by that day. I've really been spoiled because I, most of the things I've written uh, in recent years have been for the New York Review of Books. And, and they will just wait and wait. <laughs> and they're so understanding. You know, if they say, we want a 2,000 word review and you're getting 10,000 words, they say, OK. <laughs> so very much like freshman writing teachers, right? <laughs> Whatever you want, whenever you're done, we'll take it. Yeah. That's, that's. <laughs> Don't try this in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a distractionless person. Do you, ha do you, have, do you have music on, or do you, do you really work in, in silence? Um. I prefer silence. Again, I don't know why I always think of Stanley Fish. He used to watch soap operas while he was probably <laughs> An amazing guy. I have another Stanley Fish story, but we'll save it for, for, for later. Um, I want to read something. I, I had actually thought about arranging this day completely around the Random House Handbook and finding little directives in there and then accusing Fred of not practicing what, what he preached. Uh, unfortunately, he usually does. Uh, so let me, let me read a section from the introduction to, to the Random House Handbook. People who turn out dazzling work without blotting a line are so rarely found that you can put them out of your mind. Everyone who writes for a living knows what you two should remember. By and large, writing is rewriting. Even the most accomplished authors start with drafts that would be woefully inadequate except as drafts. That is, as means of getting going in an exploratory process that will usually include many, a good many setbacks and shifts of direction. To feel dissatisfied with a sample of your prose, then, is not a sign of anything but about your talent. The good writer is the one who can turn such dissatisfaction to a positive end 
by pressing ahead with the labor of revision, knowing that niceties of style will come more easily once an adequate structure of ideas has been developed. You alluded to that uh, earlier, but can you talk about that a little more in terms of your own, your own writing, your revision process? Yeah. Um, I've actually gone through various phases in my own career in which revision has been more and less prominent. I started out, the first, the first book I ever wrote, I wrote when I was an undergraduate. And my second book was published when I was 29. And a very little revision was involved in those because I was naive. I thought my writing was just fine the way it was. Um, but something interesting happened with that second book. <coughs> I happened to be living in Italy when the proofs of the second book, the one on E.M. Forster, came to me. And I was sitting there correcting the proofs. And my wife, who has an MA in English from Cal, uh, said, well, gee, I'd like to kind of take a look at these. <laughs> and she did. And she said, you know, this is the wordiest bunch of crap I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely illogical. And who do you think you are? <laughs> Mr. Big Shot. And this was, a, this was a moment of potential marital crisis. Uh, I really had to decide whether I could stand to be treated like this. <laughs> And I thought it over, and I decided that I was lucky to have somebody in my own house who could be that objective about my work. Because when she started marking up these proofs, I just said, oh my god, you're completely right. You are absolutely right. So I said, what are we going to do? And she said, well, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, but uh, it doesn't seem to me respectable to associate your name with prose like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wrote to Princeton University Press, and I said, how much will it cost me if I rewrite the book in page proof? And they named a figure, and I paid it. And I, I did the book over. And ever since, my revision process has involved my wife. <laughs> and uh, I think if she were no longer both capable and willing to perform this function, I would become a deep sea fisherman or something. I mean, I, I wouldn't write anymore because I don't trust myself. And I think that this was a tremendous lesson for me uh, that I generalized in the Random House Handbook to other writers. Uh, and I think, so, I think I did so legitimately. The truth is, you are not an expert on the value of your own writing. You just aren't, because your ego is invested in it. It's going to sound terrific to you, no matter how bad it is. <laughs> and what you need is an honest friend who will be ruthless with you. And you know, TAs are taught to say something nice and then tell the truth. <laughs> You should get to the point where you don't need to have the nice thing said, because if it's, if it's already good, what is there to say about it? That's not, that's not of any interest to you. Other people will find out how good it is. You've got to put your time in, in fixing up the things that are, that are way off. And my feeling about my own writing, and I, and I think also about other people's writing, is that if you are serious about revision and serious about listening to people who can give you a really hard-nosed, rational critique of your work, your eventual prose is going to turn out to be better than yourself. It's going to be more logical than you are. It's going to be more eloquent than you are. Um, it's going to impress people in a way that you don't impress people. <laughs> and, uh, and then you get the thrill of being known for something that is an artifact of a process rather than for your own beautiful inner nature. <laughs> and at my age, I'll take it. <laughs> You've brought up two things that, that I'm trying to figure out which I want to ask first. Uh, 
since you, you've talked about uh, your inability, at least when you were young, for, for self-criticism, a, a, a number of Fred's books now, uh, for instance, there's a, a reissue of his book on Hawthorne, which he didn't change the book itself, but he added an afterword to the book to talk about what he would have changed. And he went into great detail criticizing his, his own writing. And in another collection of his essays, he's done the same thing. He, he prefaces each essay with a critique of, of the essay. So my question is, are you now a better reviewer of your own work, or is it only work that's long in the past? Well, this has to do with a topic that we probably shouldn't go into, and that is the specific ideas that I once felt some allegiance toward and then gradually changed my mind about. Um, there was a period in my life when I was seriously confused about what I believed, and the confusion came out in my prose. And from, I would say, the late 1970s until now, my views have been much the same. There's been very little evolution. I've read a lot of stuff, but it has not changed my values or, or my opinions very much. Um, and that has, that has meant that I really don't need to revise as much now as I did 15, 20 years ago. Um, I probably lost the point of the question. No, that I, you don't revise. So you feel that you're a, you're a better critic of your own work now um, than you were? Well, it, writing is just a whole lot easier when you know which side you're on. Um, I really spent a number of years uh, in dialogue with my own previous beliefs, always trying to sound very smart and very final while feeling confused. And that's not a good position to be in, but what, what can I say? It's my life. Um, I revise less now, yeah. But uh, I think at the height of my self-doubt as, as an evaluator of ideas, I would typically write 10 or 11 drafts of an essay and think nothing of it. I mean, that, I, I would expect to go through 10 drafts. Yeah. I think that should be a lesson for all of us. Uh, I hope my students are listening. Uh, I'd like to, to talk about audience with you a while in several different ways. And this means I'm going to have to thumb through some books to, to quote you. But I'd like to start with just the general uh, notion that, that unlike most people I've read, you really do write for very different and specific audiences from time to time. There's the Random House Handbook. Um, there is uh, the, so the books on, on Hawthorne, say, which are, are really for people who are studying literature. Uh, there's uh, the book on Freud. There's the book on, on recovered memory. And all of these seem to have different audiences. So the, the question is, what, what adjustments do you make in your own writing for different audiences? Or what in, in style and content? Well, I'm not sure if I have anything very illuminating to say about it. I do think about the, the so-called average reader, the average expected reader of whatever it is that I'm writing. And uh, obviously, when writing for uh, freshman English students uh, and, and writing for scholars, I do take uh, a slightly different tone, but what, what's really different is I ask myself, what can I take for granted here and what, what needs to be spelled out? And of course, I spell out more for, for readers who don't have that much background. But, you know, it's been a long time since I wrote regularly for academic journals. Uh, frankly, I lost interest in it. I found it much more challenging and socially rewarding to write for the general public. Uh, but that's, of course, the general literate public. Um, and when I write for the New York Review of Books, I don't think too much about the audience because I feel at home with the magazine. You, you said socially rewarding. I think that was the phrase. Yes, socially rewarding. Well, this gets us into values. And we I mean, certainly want to stay where we are from those. Uh, well, <laughs> no, I, I'm all in favor of talking about values, but I don't think we should talk about the specific merits of psychoanalysis and recovered memory theory and so on. Uh, my values are democratic, 
and they are rational and empirical. Um, this could put you to sleep, of course. I mean, this, is, this sounds perfectly ordinary. But it's not necessarily the case. Uh, to be loyal to these values in certain situations causes you to give offense to a lot of people. I don't want to go into any great detail, but uh, I have felt more and more that my writing career is dedicated to the idea, first of all, of people treating each other with respect, and that means in therapeutic and non-therapeutic situations, and people taking seriously the idea that propositions about the world need to be checked out. I know it sounds silly, <laughs> but it isn't. The, the treating people with respect is, is interesting because I've been uh, discussing, as a matter of fact, with my students, the, the essay, the review of the, the three books on, on aliens. Oh, well, I don't treat Whitley Strieber with respect. That's <laughs> and what I wanted to ask you <laughs> was the... Uh, He's not really human, you know. <laughs> um, was, was the difference between uh, insulting and offending, because I think you're quite happy to offend people, but have no wish to insult people except for, apparently, Whitley Strieber. You're right. I don't mind offending people who put forward ideas that I think are pernicious. And I think the stuff about UFO abduction isn't just um, amusingly wild. I think it's pernicious. It harms people. Uh, because a certain number of citizens become convinced that they've had this horrible extraterrestrial experience and their lives are destroyed by it. I don't think that's funny. Um, so, you know, in my writing, I do look for opportunities to engage my debaterly penchant, but to do so in a way which will be helpful to the general good. And there are an awful lot of scams out there and an awful lot of uh, sincerely held beliefs that are really quite dangerous. And, and I think it's both fun and deeply satisfying to me to go after uh, this kind of thinking. I want to come back to the fun in just a moment. I have one more about audience. Um, it's from skeptical in engagements. Uh, I address my arguments to readers who still cherish common sense and who suspect that schemes of drastic liberation are not always what they claim to be. Yeah. Uh, you often do specify in your book somewhere near the beginning, the audience for those books. But I was taken by this because this seems to me to not just specify, but to be a bandwagon appeal, because I certainly want to be thought of as someone who cherishes common sense. Uh, and so I'm more inclined to believe you because you've used this rhetorical appeal. Is that? Absolutely. Conscious? I was trying to recruit you and your fellow uh, <laughs> adherence to common sense there. <laughs> but you can't imagine how many academic readers are, are shocked by such an appeal. They regard it as anti-intellectual. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Why, explain why they, why they think that. Well, because since the 1970s or so, in the humanities and some of the social sciences, we've had a movement, a very broadly based movement, originating largely from France, uh, to make the, make the humanities postmodern and post-structural in the sense of being much more uh, wary of truth claims. Um, and this wariness includes a denigration of the idea of evidence the idea that we can reach conclusions in an empirical way. This is now all part of Cartesian logocentrism, and it's tied up with slavery and who knows what else. And I don't think so. I think that the Enlightenment had it right the first time, that we can free ourselves from superstition by thinking straight. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And in fact, you outline that very clearly uh, in a number of places, I think. Let me try this.
It's more or less what you've said, but you've said it in print. The emergence of latter-day psychoanalytic incest inquisitors constitutes the most dramatic sign that the work of this present book is neither antiqua to an antiquarian nor superfluous. I wish you wouldn't have put both those words together. <laughs> <laughs> but urgently practical. And I, I find that interesting in, in books like this, that you remind us constantly that these are not just empty intellectual exercises played out in the pages of the New York Review, but you see that there's something that you're trying to, to do. So you see yourself as a real social, uh, give me a word, <laughs> social guy. No, you know what I mean. You can't be butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Well, <laughs> you're supposed to help me at that point, I believe. Um, <laughs> You talked about fun, and that makes me think of the evolution of your work. Yeah. And I have noticed a real evolution when I look at your work from, from the earliest work. Uh, the, the first books are fine uh, mm. and interesting in their own way. Uh, and then there's the, the blip of The Pooh Perplex, which I encourage everyone to find a copy of. It's uh, Fred's satire of... Uh, the writing of, of literary critics. Uh, but then starting around uh, the, the late 70s, you developed this extremely strong, uh, very forceful tone. Uh, it's sort of, as, sort of as if you uh, finally made up your mind about the things that, that were bothering you and knew how to, to convey that and circle back to, to some of that, but I don't want to leave out uh, the poo perplex. And you all have heard uh, a piece of it, and it's on the, the sheet in front of you. But I want to ask you, was that, was that fun to write? Uh, that was a unique experience. Um, it was great fun. I wrote the book in 20 days flat. Uh, I wrote it out of my sense of all of the junk that I'd been taught in graduate school. I just wanted to unload it on somebody else. <laughs> I never thought it would be published. Actually, it got on the New York Times bestseller list for a couple of weeks. Um, it was written with complete naivete about the effect it would have on people. If I thought about it more carefully, I would have been worried that I'd given offense to powerful people in my own field. But as it turned out, there was no need for worry, because everybody who read the book saw somebody else in the <laughs> characters. Um, and yeah, I just had a ball writing it and, you know, I sent it off to E.P. Dutton because they did the poo books and, and they didn't write back. And so after a couple of months, I wrote them a little note and said, did you receive this manuscript? And they said, oh yeah, we're publishing it. <laughs> it's all very casual. And uh, innocence like that cannot be recaptured. And of course, you, you defined at least how I always define satire uh, when you were speaking, and that is that everyone sees everyone else and not, not themselves. Yeah, that's swift, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me read two of the study questions that Fred has attached uh, to the end of, I believe this is, a la recherche du temps du peu perdu. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's, if that's the one. Um, questions and study project, so think of yourself when you were a freshman or if you are a freshman now. Uh, Professor Thumb makes allusion to the general critical agreement on how happily prevailing, on the now happily prevailing uh, subject of King Lear, a play by Shakespeare. Get your teacher to recommend two or three articles on Lear from one of the many Shakespeare casebooks. Read the articles and make a report to your class on the agreed upon meaning of the play. If you find that you have some extra time, you might read the play itself. <laughs> And the second one, who was James Joyce? Do you agree with the wish that he had never been born? <laughs> <laughs> or, or do you subscribe rather to a live and let live philosophy? <laughs> uh, uh. We unfortunately must move from poo to, uh, uh, were you sighing on purpose? Uh, to, to another of Fred's books, uh, The Patch Commission. Oh no. No, no. I feel like this Cancel is sort that. of a, Cancel this is that. your life. But we're all entitled to at least one lemon, right? Uh, <laughs> that was it. 
So, Please, so, no. no. <laughs> I feel that my work here is done, just for his response. <laughs> the, when I was drafting the press release for this, and I, was, and I wasn't yet familiar with all of his books, but I had pulled some things up from somewhere, mm -hmm. and I had listed uh, the Patch Commission uh, on the press release, and Fred called me and said, perhaps you could drop that one. Uh, <laughs> your exact words were, it bombed. Uh, <laughs> It's another satire, and actually, I, I, I rather enjoyed it. Uh, it's a satire of a government commission, and government commissions have not changed since you, since you wrote this book. But I, what I want to talk about is why it bombed, how you felt. Oh, there, is, there are few feelings in life that are worse than finding out that your reputation as a very funny person is about to go down the tube. <laughs> you know, I, thought, I was thinking of this when Carolyn was introducing me and saying how funny I was, because I remember this sentence from um, Garrison Keillor, who once described how he'd been introduced on a radio show as the funniest man in America. And he said, it was like a funeral in reverse, he said. <laughs> First came the eulogy, and then I died. <laughs> well, I wrote, I wrote this book on the assumption that my reputation as a humorist for the Pooh Perplex would, would carry me through uh, a, another satirical book. And uh, it did get a few good reviews, but the public voted no. And I think the public was right. So. so this isn't a book you would reissue? Or is it a book you would reissue? No, no way. In fact, I'll buy up your copy. <laughs> <laughs> I have the library copy, and I'll be returning it to the library for those of you who, who, who need, need to see it. Um, tone, tone and style, I want to talk. Because that's, that's sort of, I, I think if beyond the, the purpose that you have in your, in your writing uh, that I think is so strong and wonderful. Uh, the tone really does a lot, a lot for that. And um, in the uh, Random House Handbook, this is one of those places where I'm going to hold you accountable for, for what you say. In the Random House Handbook, uh, you uh, devote a moment to ad hominem arguments and explain that they aren't uh, usually very, very good. Uh, and you have been accused recently, quite frequently, especially in your work with Freud, of using ad, ad hominem arguments. And in The Memory Wars, uh, by the way, The Memory Wars is, is a fascinating book because Fred has included his original essays from the New York Review of Books, and then the long, often vitriolic responses to those essays. Uh, and then, of course, as, as the writer of the book, he also gets to have the last word. So after, then he responds to those. But I want to quote just a bit of one critic who says, I have these all carefully marked. Um, but as the article goes on, an intemperate note enters into the argument, an angry and ad hominem note. Uh, that's actually one of the nicer things that <laughs> someone say. Uh, Fred, Fred's response. The unpublished letters also converge in calling my essay ad hominem, uh, as several of the published letters do as well. I deny the charge. An ad hominem argument is one that ducks substantive issues by vilifying the person or kind of person who takes the positions opposite to one's own. The next paragraph, which is quite a ways down. Although I can hardly expect psychoanalysis to be grateful for my restraint, more, moreover, I actually steered clear of their founder's least stable side, his lethal cocaine evangelism, his phobias and psychosomatic fainting spells, his bizarre superstitions, his belief in the magic power of the telephone and hotel room numbers, his <laughs> affinity for ESP, his Gnostic ideas about the primal horde and its Lamarackian effect on modern psyches, his paranoid streak, and what even his hagiographer Ernest Jones calls his twilight condition of the mind at the time of his famous self-analysis. Um, what I believe Fred has done there is, in fact, by saying, I won't dwell and I did not dwell, managed to get his entire ad hominem argument in there. All right, I, I'll, I'll reply quite seriously. 
Even that paragraph was not ad hominem. Why? It was biographical. <laughs> if Freud had certain traits, it's not my fault if I report what they were. <laughs> to repeat what I said in the first paragraph, the quoted there, an ad hominem argument is one which ducks the substantive issue. The substantive issue with regard to psychoanalysis is, what is the evidential basis for this system of thought? Well, I talk about that. In fact, I've been talking about it since 1980. Um, there's, there's an abundant record of my views on the philosophical underpinnings of psychoanalysis. But that aside, we have Sigmund Freud, a great historic figure in the 20th century, and we want to know things about him. Well, there are a lot of things about him that were put under the rug by the Ernest Jones tradition of a hagiography. And I, among others, have rolled up that rug, swept the dirt out, and said, here it is. But that's not ad hominem. That is biographical. <laughs> Note, please. <laughs> We're going to wind up in about five minutes so that we can leave time for, for questions. Uh, I, I know a lot of people, especially at universities, when they start writing, feel that, there, that there's sort of this intellectual goal, this, this plateau, this, this kind of writing that is slightly more formal, uh, that doesn't talk about certain things because it really doesn't, doesn't fit with, with uh, university writing. And the whole issue of what is formal and, and what is informal, I think, is, is interesting. And Fred, I, I don't think of sort of as either formal or informal, just informative. But I wanted to read one passage that shows you that uh, even in the midst of talking about something as, as serious and as important and as complex as uh, recovered memory syn syndrome, um, will throw in a line that strikes me as sort of informal, maybe may funny. Um, Freud elsewhere reports that Pankeev's mother dislikes sex, for example, yet here he has the wedded pair going at it repeatedly like teenagers on speed with a one-year-old kibitzer precociously keeping score while observing from across the room both his mother's castrated genitals and her rapt but suitably passive facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you, if you can oh, comment yeah, the on next the, the next sentence is good, too. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to the podium. You just tell me what, what to read. A feat of observation, as Mahoney has remarked, that would exceed the ingenious staging of any pornographic film producer. There. You're right. <laughs> um, so can, can you talk and say anything about, about style in general and, and what, what you perceive as your, your style? Well, I think we all have to feel our way toward what our own style will be. As writers, we don't start out having a style. The best thing we can do is to read a whole lot of other people's prose and, and listen for the bells to go off. Um, when the bell goes off, you're hearing something you would like to be like yourself. Uh, I wish I'd said that. And you may not know why you wish you'd said it, but you know that this sentence has the right ring for you. And I can give you some examples of sentences that I have loved over the years that just sounded right to me. For example, and I think I put this one in the Random House Handbook, a feminist critic reviewing Norman Mailer's book, The Prisoner of Sex, says, he combs metaphors across the bald spots on his theory. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> or a sentence I once read a, on a sports page in Philadelphia Inquirer. Tom Landry would not recognize a drug problem on the Dallas Cowboys until his middle linebacker got down on his hands and knees and tried to inhale the 40-yard line. <laughs> I, I hope that you'll, you'll read the short cruise reader on, on the back because uh, of, of the sheet that you have, because those are my versions 
of what you've just done. Those are, those are really wonderful lines by, by Fred. Uh, I want to wrap up with uh, one more actually wonderful line. Uh, and we haven't really talked about your humor, and we're going to do it very quickly. But I w everyone I know is going to be so glad <coughs> when today is over with because I have spent just a huge amount of time reading sections of, of your books to people, and I believe they've gotten slightly, slightly tired of them. Uh, but I want to read about little Hans, if I can find him. Mm. Do you have any idea? Yeah, sure. It um, should be this red. Right there. <laughs> Thank you. See, he opens right to it. Uh, again, this is from Unauthorized Freud, and I'm going to sort of jump and, and it'll, I think it sounds fairly seamless, but I'm going to jump through, through two paragraphs. Uh, this is the, the story of uh, Herbert Graf, who was five years old when his father, one of Freud's uh, early supporters, uh, started uh, psychoanalyzing him. Uh, in January 1908, little Hans developed an acute and worsening fear of horses, thus affording both Graf Sr. and Freud himself a precious opportunity to study the phenomenon of childhood phobia. Freud saw Hans only once, but was able to reassure him on the basis of previous communications with the father that he needn't worry. The dreaded horse was nothing but a stand-in for that father, who did not, Freud explained, actually intend to castrate him, just because Hans unconsciously considered him a sexual rival. And thus comforted, the story goes, Hans immediately began to improve. <laughs> Freud was especially delighted with the case because in his analyses of adults, he could only reconstruct the tempest of childhood sexuality. Here, in contrast, the thing itself was being disclosed at point-blank range by a boy who seemed all but ready to confess that he wished to fornicate with his mother, murder his father, and do away with his little sister in the bargain. <laughs> Above all, Freud and the elder Graf discounted the elemental fact that Hans had acquired his horse phobia when he had been frightened by a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the note in that passage is that it's funny, but also we get the clearest picture of what's going on by, by the way you say it. Do you work on sections like that a lot? I mean, do, you, do you dwell on those? Or do they just come out? Tell us you work a lot on them. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I can't remember whether I worked harder on that than some other passage, but I would say that I never try to be funny for the sake of being funny. Uh, I think the facts are often the funniest thing in the world. Uh, if they are lined up properly with the pretensions that they contradict. So that's what I try to do. Is it more fun to write these things or to have written, or did you find it more fun when you were writing uh, The Pooh Perplex? Well, nothing was more fun than The Pooh Perplex. Um, but I, I enjoy writing this stuff, and I uh, don't mind the polemics surrounding them. Uh, in fact, I look forward to a lot of the, the debate surrounding my work. Um, I've developed a very thick skin over the years about criticism of me personally. And in general, I am sensitive to only one thing, and that is being shown to have been wrong. I hate to be wrong. And if somebody can say to me, you know, you've misquoted this, or you're illogical here, and, and I'm obliged to agree, I feel truly mortified. But if somebody says to me, you're sick, uh, you know, you have all this inner hatred built up, and you're just spewing it out on poor Freud. I just say, oh, go away. <laughs> I'm not interested in stuff like that, because I know what I'm doing. I, I'm afraid to read anything anymore. Uh, <laughs> now, I would like to, <laughs> I'd like to end this with just uh, two passages that seem to me to really sum up uh, a lot about Fred, uh, both ideas and, and style. I think these are two passages that both come together in a really remarkable way, and then we'll uh, take, take some questions. I, one of these might occur uh, in, in at least a piece of it on the sheet that you have. 
When the Freud whom students first encounter is the one who accused Emma Eckstein of bleeding for love, who hounded Dora with monomaniacal accusations, who lied about his cures, and who enshrined crackpot doctrines in the heart of, exp of his explanatory system. And when further, even intellectuals have grown wary of a therapy whose claims remain wholly unsubstantiated, psychoanalytic dogma will no longer seem esoteric, but merely archaic. And when that judgment becomes general, perhaps our successors will be able to understand more fully how, in the inebriate moral atmosphere of our century, we came to befuddle ourselves with the extraordinary and consequential delusion of Freudian thought. And given our locale, one on teachers. There is, of course, a socially progressive role to be played by professors of literature. We can help to make our students more capable of independent judgment by teaching them to read accurately and to write scrupulously in a comprehensible idiom. Our own prose can set an example in this regard. I'll just stop there because I think Fred's prose does. I want to thank you very much, Fred. Thank you. Questions? Are you afraid? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you're um, working on an essay, either writing it the first time or rewriting it, how do you know when you're done? Do you have a sense that you're finished? Okay, the question is how do I know when I'm finished? Mm. Uh, the whole thing has to add up. If there are contradictions, if there are even little strands of self-opposition in it, they have to be straightened out. Um, if it ends on a dying fall, if it doesn't end in a, in a way that feels conclusive, I'm not finished. Uh, if I give away too much toward the beginning, it's not finished. Um, these are all sort of standard dramatic uh, criteria that, that one tries to apply to, to his own prose. Um, I, I, I don't know what more to say. Yeah. I have a question. As a beginner writer, do you, do, you, do you focus much more on the sophistication of words or just on its content in rewriting it? Well, I guess I'll give a complicated answer to that. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Um, if you really want to be a writer, you have to be in love with words. And the earlier you fall in love with words, the better. Uh, and you don't necessarily know what use you're going to put these words to. But unless, unless strange words sound interesting to you, you're probably never going to be a writer. Um, and I know in my own life, it's taken me a long, long time to arrive at ideas that I now consider to be worthy of being expressed. But when I was 11 years old, I wanted to be a writer. Uh, so you, you, you really have to kind of grow into your subject matter. And I would say, and again, this isn't directly answering your question, but I would say that to aim at being a writer is not really the way to be a writer. To become a writer uh, you need to master a subject matter or you need to be able to characterize your own experience in an interesting way. You need to have some interesting experience. Or failing that, because I don't think my life has been particularly interesting, you have to read a lot of books. Uh, you, you need to get to be up on something that you can then write about with authority. Uh, now, none of this answers your question because you're asking about the, the, the the student paper, really. I would say, by all means, concentrate on the ideas and worry about the expression last. Uh, it won't do to have a confused argument that is elegantly expressed. And in fact, it won't be elegantly expressed. It can't be done, really. Uh, good prose comes out of the clarity that you reach when you've solved the problem at hand. So the thing to do is to try to solve the problem. 
And as I said at the very beginning, you know, in answer to the first question that was asked, what I worry about from the very beginning when I work on a project is leaving out of account considerations that somebody else could bring up against my argument. I want them to be included in my argument. I want my argument to have enough nuance in it or enough anticipation of objections in it so that it will be relatively in, in, invulnerable to that kind of criticism. So by all means, ideas, 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 and then style, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you said you wrote your first book when you were an uh, undergraduate, yeah. maybe 18 or 19. I just wanted to know what you thought a writer is and at what point did you consider yourself to be that? Well, I was a little lucky because um, the college I went to had a prize for the best senior essay. I, uh, and my senior essay was about 150 pages long. And the prize was that it could be published by Yale University Press. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened to me. Uh, made the rest of my career just like kind of rolling down a grassy hill. Really mm. Very nice. Um, nice work if you can get it. It's not, it's not helpful for me to say this uh, about myself. Um, I didn't think of myself as a writer at that point, but I thought of myself as an apprentice literary critic who had done a job of literary criticism in college and, uh, and wanted to continue doing more of the same. And I think in general, one always writes within a context. And the context of my first two books was the expectations that are brought to young people starting an academic career in English. And when I go back and look at this first book that I wrote, and I can just barely stand to look at it, <laughs> what I see is all the mannerisms of a certain school of literary criticism, which I had absorbed in my undergraduate years without even knowing the name of it. But they're all there. And I, I guess I was uh, a kind of impressionist, not like Monet. I'm m more like, you know, uh, Dana Carvey. Uh, <laughs> I was taking an impression of these critics and, and, and giving a version of it myself without realizing that that's what I was doing. And I only gradually outgrew that kind of imitativeness, but I recommend it. I mean, why not start, why not start by emulating the people in your field, whatever it is that they're doing right. Go out and do it. And if you do it the way they do it, sooner or later, you'll start to ver diverge from, from their path, and you will get your own voice. But to my way of thinking, there is no way of starting out with your own voice. You know, a lot of young people think of themselves as, as poets and novelists uh, in the making, and their overwhelming concern as writers is to be faithful to what they deeply know. But what they don't realize is what they deeply know is what everybody else knows. Their experience is not all that original. It's typical. And you have to have some untypical experiences or you have to do some untypical reading before your writing will get interesting. That's just the way it is. You know, Flannery O'Connor uh, was once famously asked when she gave a um, a reading, there was a question period afterwards, great American short story writer, novelist. The question was, Miss O'Connor, do you feel that college creative writing courses stifle young writers? And she said, they don't stifle enough of them. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather not because, um, gee, this is one of the few occasions in recent years that I've been able to speak non-antagonistically. <laughs> uh, the, the real question maybe to get at is, what is your views, or do you talk more about um, what counts as evidence and what counts as a sort of method of logic um, when one is doing literary criticism, perhaps, versus traditional social science research versus thinking in natural science about uh -huh. physics, chemistry? 
do you think those are three different sort of are there three different bases of knowledge and bases of, of logic there, or are they one and the same? And just well, this is a really good question, but it takes a long answer, and I don't want to give a long answer. Let me just say that obviously different subject matters. Um, give us opportunities for different degrees of assurance about our conclusions. Our conclusions about math, very solid. Physics, quite solid. Literary criticism, not so solid. However, it's a rational enterprise in all, in all of these fields. The question is always, can we account for the data? Maybe not math because it's, you know, it's logical, it's self-referential. But what is the best way to account for the data? And I feel that too many people in the humanities assume that the humanities can properly distinguish themselves from the sciences by conspicuously not caring about empirical considerations. I don't know how many of you saw the letters in the Sunday Chronicle book section about the, review, the favorable review of my book on authorized Freud, but I knew those letters were there. I just opened up the Sunday paper and I said, here, here they come, and I could, I could have told you what was in them, because they're always the same. This guy says, what is this professor of literature doing talking about science? What, what is he, why, why does he care about Freud? Why doesn't he just, you know, go, uh, read some books and be humanistic, you know? <laughs> and another letter said, uh, we, don't, we don't need all of this scientific consideration to find out whether the interpretation of dreams is the best book ever written on dreams. All we have to do is analyze our dreams. And, and sure enough, you know, they're, they're Freudian. Well, I say no. The criteria by which we should evaluate a book either in psychology or in literary criticism, are essentially the same. And those criteria are, has an adequate account of the evidence been given in a way which also takes care of rival explanations, possible rival explanations? And if we had a half an hour to talk about it, that's what I would talk about, is the um, absence of regard for rival possibilities of explanation. In the humanities today, there is very, very little such concern, and I think there should be a great deal more. Yeah. So a question. I've been listening to you um, talk a lot about young writers and young people as writers. Yeah. A lot of what you say is maybe contrary to what I would tell my students about how to approach their job of writing. And I was wondering if you could tell us how you see sort of the job of a Writer here at the university, you know, trying yeah. to find voice or trying to find subject matter or writing about their ordinary experiences in a way that will change. You know, how do you do that? Well, you're, you're right in what you said about uh, my emphasis today. I've really been thinking more about people who have a yearning to be a writer. And of course, in college, a lot of people write a lot of papers without any intention of ever being writers. Um, all the advice I have on the subject is standard advice, and it's all there in the Random House Handbook and in another book I did called the Borzoi Handbook for Writers. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no breakthrough advice that I can offer to people who want to write about their own experience. I would just say, uh, think about your reader. Um, if you're going to write about your experience, don't think that because it happened to you, it's intrinsically interesting. Make it interesting. Think of the rhetorical devices you can use. Think of the dramatic tricks you can play. Withhold information from the reader. Play surprises on the reader. Have some fun with the reader. Think of it as a rhetorical occasion, not a confessional occasion. Mm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> now, that's why I said how very unhelpful it is of me to say what good luck I had. Uh, no, it's a hard, hard world out there. Uh, getting one's writing published is one of the hardest things that there is in the whole world. Um, there are magazines, little magazines, that are hurting for material. 
um, start there. And don't mail your stuff off to the New Yorker. They're not going to take it. They're not even going to look at it. So be realistic. Uh, if you are in a needy state for getting something in print, try to find some uh, uh, entity, some magazine or paper that's equally needy. And you know, it'll be a lot of fun to see your work in print, even if very few people read it. And who knows, maybe somebody will notice it and say, that's not so bad. And maybe you can take that to somebody else, or some editor, and say, see, I can do this kind of work. But you, ha you have to start quite near the bottom, as a rule. Time for one more. How has your work as a writer and your accomplishments and your journey informed the teaching of, of writing? Well, I'm like one of those uh, geese that uh, Conrad Lorenz talks about. Uh, I was imprinted upon my first teaching experience. Uh, which was freshman English here at Berkeley in 1958. And I just loved that course. I was terrified by it. I didn't know what I was doing. Nobody gave me any advice. I'd never been a TA. I was just thrown into this class with kids who were not that much younger than I was. I was 25. Um, and this was the most exciting experience for me to take California kids, I knew nothing about California, come from all <laughs> best schools back on the other coast, uh, and find out what they knew and what they didn't know, and introduce them to works that they would find challenging, and get them to write expository prose and argumentative prose, and work on it together with me. I thought that um, that I'd made the right choice in life, that this is what I wanted to do. I didn't aspire any higher than freshman English. And for the rest of my teaching career, which ended in 1994, the teaching of writing for me was always the primary thing. And in, in a senior seminar, you know, I, I taught a senior seminar in Mark Twain, and I had them uh, submit a couple of papers, and by the middle of the semester, I said, okay, we're not going to mention Mark Twain for the next few weeks. We're going to talk about writing, because you guys don't know how to write. And you're getting out of here with a sheepskin from Berkeley as English majors. So let's start thinking about writing. And we did, and in general, this was appreciated. And my, my hope for my colleagues is, is that they would behave similarly. If everybody on the faculty took some kind of accountability for the quality of student writing, then there would be this continuity of emphasis throughout the four years. Instead, now, things tend to go downhill in the last couple of years. A lot of people graduate writing worse than they did when they came in. And a lot of graduate students, in fact, I hate to say it, but most graduate students, in my experience, write much, much worse at the time of their PhDs than they did when they were filling out their forms for admission to graduate school. And that's because they have learned a deadly jargon. And they are not communicating with anybody. They are just doing the professional thing. And in my field, the prose that results is just a big box of pretzels. Uh, it's very sad. But it need not be that way. We have to care about the quality of writing. It's too perfect to go on after that. So, <laughs> friend, I'd like to thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll be doing this again in the spring. I'm sure Fred will be willing to hang around a few minutes to, to, oh, if you yeah. have individual questions for Thank him. You. And don't forget, now that you've heard about the books, go buy them. Thanks for coming.